place of goats and bulls and rams and sacrifices once for all and pays for our entire debt. And this kind of ties in well with um, Ephesians 9, 11 to 15. So when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then to the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of his creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer, sanctify to the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. By his blood we are redeemed completely. By his blood we can enter his presence. So let us stand and sing, I come by the blood. Thank 
So to start off with, you can actually turn to Genesis 25. We'll get there. Genesis 25. You have no idea where I'm going. You should be. Hey, Orion, let's turn this down just a bit. So I want you to think about the fact that the journey to learn something, to learn anything, I find is oftentimes interesting because it usually involves learning the thing in its whole form, but then in order to have a high level of competency or uh, feeling like you really grasp it, in order to truly learn it, we then have to learn the details in order to understand what makes it work or function or be what it is as a whole. Let me, let me break that down for you. Think about language. What is language? Language in its whole form? is the means to communicate within a specific culture or region made of words, syntax, structure, and usage. That's what language is. And therefore we can be aware of what it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean you then know a language. So to get more proficient, you then have to, in order to learn an actual language of a region or culture, you have to then study that specific language and all the parts that I mentioned. So we may know what language is, but in order to truly grasp it, you then need to start learning a language or multiple languages to appreciate what it is. Let's do something else that many of you like. What is volleyball? In its whole form, it's a sport that involves a specific ball, lineup, formation, and rules played within a divine court. Uh, you can know what volleyball is. But if you really want to know it, you then have to learn it proficiently by learning the legal moves, the strikes, the touches, and develop the means to use them with others who are doing the same. So it, to learn something, you can find out what it is in its generality, but if you want to know it, you then have to engage with it on a deeper level, on a more specific level. And you could plug that in with just about anything. What is, and fill in the blank, and you can once again know it in its whole, but if you want to be proficient with it and truly learn it and know it, you have to go deeper. Well, obviously we can do the same thing with the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is God's revelation of himself and his plan to redeem all that was lost in the Garden of Eden when sin entered the world. It is the story of God working within the realm of humanity, which he created as humanity rebels, and God takes the initiative to reconcile sin and death in order for humanity to know him, relate to him, worship him, and serve his forever kingdom. However, in order to learn it, we then must read it, study it, meditate upon all the truths and stories, and teachings it offers 
in their smaller units as we keep the whole context of the larger story in view. Now, we have been studying one of those smaller units out of the letter of Ephesians. And we've been studying the letter of Ephesians in small units. Looking at the truths and thoughts as Paul the Apostle wrote them in this letter. Today, I want to consider an Old Testament story that can help us understand the reason it is such a struggle to embrace all the spiritual blessings and gospel grace that Paul has shared thus far in our journey through Ephesians. So let's pray and we'll dig in. Father God, I pray that you will help us all to be more mindful of our inheritance and what it really means and what it really can mean in our lives. Help us to see the whole totality of your story unfolding before us. Help us to see and grasp the desperately personal nature of the gospel in our own lives and how that can change and transform us for your glorious grace. To guide our steps this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Genesis 25, looking at verse 19, says this. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. Ha ha, twins. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. I think he's referring symbolically. I don't think like that. <laughs> Just clarifying that for you. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. <clears throat> When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling the tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, here you have a story. It's one of the uh, primary stories of Israel's history because it involves the patriarchs. You had Abraham, who was the father nation, who was given the initial promises that he would father or have in his line ultimately a great nation. As it turns out, he has two. God promised that his descendants would be more numerable than the stars, and that was for sure the result. His son of promise, however, his name was Isaac. Isaac went on to live, and he lived a rich and full life, but he did not have children until he was 60, which I guess is slightly better than his dad, who didn't have Isaac until he was 100. So Isaac has twin boys. One is a hairy beast. He's a red hairy beast, which is interesting. And then you have Jacob, the little deceiver, holding onto the heel. Pull me out, basically, he's saying. Now, what's most interesting, and those of you ladies that have had children, I don't know if this is a common occurrence, that at some point at the key moments of pregnancy, you're going, what is this happening to me? It's usually in those moments, men, that they grab our bottom lip and make us pay. But anyways, <laughs> she's, she's wondering why is this turmoil going on, and that's where she finds out she has twins. God does something that I would say doesn't happen all too often. He announces a prophecy. And out of this prophecy, these two boys, as it turns out, will be the, the heads of two nations. 
And so one is the son of promise that will continue the line of Abraham to Isaac to the next and then to the next. The other, though, is going to be the father of another nation, which turned out to be Edom. And the whole journey that then unfolds between Israel, which is what Jacob ended up getting renamed later on, and Esau or Edom, which is what he got renamed later on, is a long history, and it's not a pleasant one. Let's just say holidays were not fun at the Isaac household. So what you have here is the beginning of this story. What's also interesting is that we find out two other couple key things. One, Esau was a hunter and loved to be out in the fields, which is fine, except we do need to remember they were a, a society that revolved around herds. Not hunting. Which means that you could interpret that as Esau did not like to be around the family business. Whereas Jacob, we do read out, he was actually quite skilled at the herding business. The other interesting thing, obviously, is that Isaac and Rebekah did play favorites. Now, this is not a sermon on parenting, so I'll just make the quick comment, parents. Don't do that. That's bad. And we're about to see why, because this really blows up. Let's go to 25, verse 29. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, okay, I don't know why that's important other than he's doing it. I don't know if like, that was a regular occurrence. He's cooking stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau, the great hunter, is out one day. Maybe he didn't get anything. Maybe he went out further or longer than he normally did. We don't really know. But he returns, it says, with great exhaustion and great hunger. He asks his brother for some of the stew he made. Now, let's be honest, siblings. As far as the initial request and the idea of bartering, that's normal. <laughs> you know, your, your brother or sister comes in and says, oh, let me have some. What will you give me is the oftentimes reply. Right? Yeah, you know. Don't act like you never did it, especially you adults. Come on, let's be honest. Well, what's interesting is that as his brother asked for some of the stew, Jacob, either being very full of himself or sensing some kind of opportunity, because let's be honest, as we read more of his life, we do see that he's a bit of a schemer. All right? He barters with his brother, and basically he says, stew for your birthright. Hmm. So Esau does a very feeling, very fleshly thing. You have to understand that his feelings are lying to him. They are kind of in overdrive. He is overfeeling. He is overstating his condition that he is about to die of hunger. Therefore, what good would a birthright do him? Well, Let's be honest, he's not dumb. His flesh, his feelings are telling him something that in the end are a lie. But he swears to the deal and he gets his stew. I hope it was good stew. I hope it was good bread. Because then the Bible tells us more about Esau's heart. It says he despised his birthright. You've heard me say it before, but I'll keep reminding you, anytime the scripture tells us something about an individual, we need to understand this isn't opinion, this is stating fact. This is God speaking. This is God telling us a, a key important detail in the story. And it tells us that Esau despised, took for granted, did not up, hold up high his birthright. Let's go over to chapter 27, verse 1. 
When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me, so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay. We understand now that Isaac is getting closer to death. He calls for Esau to go out and hunt some game, prepare it, serve it, so that his father then can offer him his blessing. So let me explain this real quick. The Old Testament blessing upon the eldest son is connected directly to the eldest birthright. And basically what it comes down to is the blessing is the passing on of the family wealth where the eldest son always gets the largest portion. However many other siblings there are, they will get a portion, but theirs will be very small compared to the eldest son. So quite frankly, if you were the eldest daughter and you were older than your brother, sorry, out of luck, eldest son in this culture received the greatest blessing and portion. Also, this is a passing on of position as head of the family. So as the father is nearing his death, he is blessing the eldest son with the acknowledgement that you now have permission to receive your portion of the estate. Also, you are now going to be taking position as head of the family. Also, in this particular case, as we're about to read, it includes a blessing that is passing on Abrahamic promises. So as God has promises and, and blessings upon Abraham, Abraham then, as he was dying, passes them on to Isaac because he is the child of promise. So therefore, in Isaac's mind, even though his wife received a prophecy, ah, see, we, we oftentimes read the story so fast we fail to see that in this case, Isaac was disobedient. Because Isaac was allowing culture to stand in the way of what God preferred. The prophecy says the younger shall serve the old. Sorry, the older shall serve the younger. That only can happen if that is something where the blessing and the birthright is passed on to the younger. But that doesn't make sense. That's not how it's supposed to work. But see, remember, it's just like which they, which son of Eli was anointed king? Wasn't the eldest? Not Eli. Jesse. Sorry. It wasn't Jesse's oldest. It was his youngest. God does not work according to culture, friends. God isn't in the business of making culture happy. God isn't in the business of doing things the way we think it should be done. It is God's plan. We either get on the train and join him, or we then choose to disobey him. Isaac, in this particular issue, was not obeying the Lord. So, he tells Esau, go get your stuff, get things ready, because I'm ready to bless you. So while Esau is out, Jacob and his mother conspire. Yes, it's a conspiracy. And it is. Because long story short, Jacob fools Isaac, who has weak eyes, into giving the eldest birthright to Jacob. Let's read what he says to him. Let's go to chapter 27, verse 26. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And here's the thing. See, Isaac was being sneaky because he wasn't exactly sure. And Isaac smelled Jacob. Because Jacob smells better when he's awake. Just kidding. <laughs> Some of you will get that. Sorry. And Isaac smelled the smell of the garments and blessed him and said, now here's what he is passing on to him. See, the smell of my son is as the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. 
be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. This is Isaac passing on to, unknowingly to Jacob the full measure of all that was already promised to Abraham. He is giving him, passing on to Jacob, you are the son of promise. This is important. This is no small thing. Because that means that it is Jacob's line that will continue on, that ultimately would be the father of David and Jesus. This is the family line. This is the line of promise. Well, Esau obviously finally comes back, goes and sees his father with the game that he's killed and repaired, and he's a little bit dismayed when Isaac has to tell him that he's already offered the eldest son blessing to his brother Jacob. Esau, of course, begs for the blessing that at one time he had held in contempt. And let's go to verse 39, and we find what Isaac is able to tell him. Once again, please understand, there is a prophetic element to this. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. For when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Basically, if you understand the history of the brothers, Israel and Edom often went to war, and it never went well. Um, there were a few times when Edom had the upper hand, but basically from David's time on, Edom was heard of basically no more. Esau and Jacob. Verse 41 tells us how Esau felt. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him, and Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau felt about all this ultimately was the filling of his heart with hate and the desire for murder. Now, where's the linchpin to this entire story? Well, I find it, obviously, I believe it goes back to the prophecy that was given to Rebecca concerning her sons. But also it is interesting that Esau clearly ignores his earlier contempt for his birthright. He either saw it as something that was too far distant and didn't acknowledge its importance now, and so he held it in, with contempt, and or he just <clears throat> took it for granted that because it's his, he doesn't have to treat it with any respect, However you want to spin it, however you want to determine it, the bottom line is Esau despised his birthright. And yet, when it wasn't there for him, when it was time, he felt justifiably angry and murderous. How interesting. Now, why do I share this story? As I've already read for you, Ephesians 1, 1 through 2, 10, we are reminded through this letter about all the spiritual blessings God has bestowed, okay, and that he has lavished upon us as adopted children, ultimately telling us that these blessings are our inheritance. In other words, all that Paul has talked about so far in Ephesians 1, 1 through 2, 10 is our birthright. As we become children of God, I want you to let that sink in. We are treated with the joyous love uh, as eldest children, even though we're only adopted children, emulating, called to follow the example of the life of our eldest brother, Jesus the Christ. And yet, all that is given to us, the fullness of the inheritance, is our birthright. It is the Holy Spirit that seals the promise, and Paul prays for the church to grow in its understanding of all that God has given, all the power God has, has and continues to use on our behalf for his glory as he seeks to establish all things under the feet of Christ. You read 1, 1 through 2, 10, and it is just full of the richness of the hope of the gospel. 
wonderful truth after truth after truth, all of which we can grab a hold of every day, all day. So please consider this. Paul is reminding the church the reason we need our birthright. Without it, we are walking dead. But God, praise his name, steps in with great mercy, great love, and he raises us to life in We were walking dead. Now we are alive, raised up with Christ. Once again, our birthright in the newness of our new creation, in our new life in Christ. By grace, God gave us our birthright as his children to save us from death, save us from sin, not out of anything we have done ourselves, not out of any works we have done, but simply his grace, his choosing, his work in our lives, giving us the faith we would need to trust him. And in the midst of all that, filling our lives with the fullness of his loving grace and purposes to serve his kingdom with works he has prepared beforehand. I know, chapter 1, 1 through 2, 10 is so hot, chock full, it is hard to just Try to hold on to all of it at once. But it's good if, for us to do that. So here is the simple but terrifying question. What do we do with our birthright? How do we see it? Is it precious to us? Is our birthright important? Is it something we take to heart every day, throughout the day, understanding we are not our own, we belong to Christ, and he has works for us to do every day, works that reveal or show his grace, his love, his kindness, his mercy? Do we understand that our birthright is not just for eternal tomorrow? but is meant to literally fill our lives right now. Do we, do we want that, or, or do we care that our birthright is actually meant to transform us, to define us? So in other words, when we say, I am a Christian, let's, let's remove all cultural norms, let's remove all aspects of religious history, and just ask it according to the scriptures. Are you a Christian? One who believes in Jesus the Christ by faith, accepting him, as Romans says, as Lord, and believing that he is resurrected from the dead. Are you one who follows Christ? Does it define you? And that means with your money, with your time, with every facet of your life, all of your relationships, all of it is now designed, it's intended to transform us and therefore be a part of every little part of life. Is that how we see our birthright? Or do we sell it for a bowl of soup? Do we see our birthright in Christ as worthless? And if it can get us a bowl of stew, then so be it. Let's think about the conditions of Esau's choosing to despise his birthright. At the time that he returned, he was emotional. He was impulsive. He was self-seeking, very driven by his flesh. And very normal. There's not many of us that wouldn't have done the same thing. Maybe our price would have been a little different. But in the end, in very similar cir circumstances, we would have done the exact same thing. What I'm trying to help all of us see is simply that our normal 
in the flesh is to let our emotions rule, our flesh rule, the moments of any given day. Our thoughts rule our perceptions and feelings about a situation or person. The need and desire to satisfy the flesh is so strong and so normal that Paul is writing to the church to urge them to meditate upon the truths of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, the promise of the gospel, to better inform and rule our moments. Because God understands that our normal in the flesh is to sell our birthright for sin. It is no accident that Paul spent the first three chapters of this letter reminding the church who already believed what the gospel offers. It is no accident that Paul is writing it in such a way where he encourages them not only remember it, but pray over it. He gives two prayers in chapters 1 through 3. Twice he prays for the church in his letter so that they won't sell their birthright for stew. If God is who he says he is, then his way, his view of how things are and how things should be and how things are going is far greater and better than ours. Friends, Esau wasn't dying, but his thoughts and his feelings were feeding his flesh, urging him to despise something that was actually really important. And let me be clear, the sins of the parents enabled the sins of the son. For friends, make no mistake, we are our brother's keeper. We do impact one another. Our, our sin struggles help encourage others to sin, and vice versa. Whether it's in your home, or at workplace, or anywhere, if we compromise, when we compromise, when we are self-determined, when we choose flesh, when we sell for the stew, that impacts the people around us. What is your stew? Maybe we express our stew through means of manipulation, even if it's subtle. Perhaps our stew is dependency on a substance or a video stream or a person. Maybe our stew is found in a mindset towards specific people or type of people as we perceive them. Maybe our stew is thoughts that are lies about ourselves or others that we believe because it's just easier or something we have just done for a long time. Maybe our stew can be found in pleasure, greed, gluttony, gossip, anger, and of course, pride and or fear. What I'm trying to tell you is that there are multiple things in our daily lives in the flesh that we are willing to sell our birthright for. But just like Esau, it's not that we're selling it permanently. I guarantee you, Esau forgot about what he swore for the stew because he didn't really take it seriously. He wasn't taking any of it seriously. He held his birthright in contempt. Make no mistake, just because you have the fullness of the gospel does not mean it you have the right to take it for granted. We should not sell it cheaply. Obviously, we shouldn't sell it at all. So the most important part to this whole thing is to understand that we all have stews we are willing to sell our birthrights for. It's not a permanent sale, at least not in our thinking. We're not telling God to take a hike. We're just telling him that what he's offering isn't enough. We want more. We want something different. We want what our emotions and our thoughts tell us we want. More than we want what God wants. There are a lot of neutral things in this life that we just go for. Not, that's not the problem. The problem is, is we didn't even consult or seek God before we did it. He's not even part of the equation. He's not even part of the discussion that's what I mean by selling our birthright. 
we remove God out of the moment, out of the conflict, out of the felt need or want, so that we can acquire it, engage with it, use it, and then when we're on the other side, we'll either just say we're sorry, or a lot of times we don't even see anything wrong with it and just move on, not realizing that we held our birthright with contempt. So Paul writes this letter the way he has, stressing the truths he stresses, the way he did as a warning, as a plea, and as a hopeful encouragement to the church, don't sell your birthright. Let God be God in all of our moments to remind ourselves of God's promise to be present, to give strength, to give me wisdom, to open the eyes of my heart, to keep me under his strong hand, working on me for his glory and enabling me to become more and more like Jesus in all of our daily moments. If we are his workmanship and he has works for us prepared beforehand to do every day, all day, friends, the opportunity to be full of all that God has given is a real thing. Our birthright is a real active thing right But it's so easy to hold it with contempt. What amazing truth Ephesians 1, 1 through 2, 10 offers us. Yet how often we sell the hope and joy and peace for worldly stew. And here's the saddest part. The stew in truth is spoiled. It's full of empty hopes, pleasures, and lies. Think of it another way. The stew in reality is full of vomit, human waste, and death. And yet we often trust it more than God. Why? Because it's normal. It's a strong compulsion. It's oftentimes easier. And the honest truth, we oftentimes like it more than what God is offering. God offers his grace. God offers and gives his great power, his great love to fill us with new life. But each day and throughout the day, we have to intentionally engage God. And we can do so through a variety of relational means. We can engage God through his Bible. We can engage God through prayer and fellowship and worship. Humble obedience, it's not really complicated or difficult to engage God. There's no checklist, there's no requirements of a daily dosage. It is a relational engagement. You either want him or you don't. But I will say this, that engagement does not happen by accident. All that Paul reminds the church of, all that Paul prays for the church to both know and receive from God are things we need to reach for and ask for and live out of. And let me just be clear. It's not because God's stingy. It's not because he plays games with us where he shows it to us and then pulls it back. It's not a game to him. It says he lavishes these things upon us. It's basically like picking right through off the lowest branches. It's easy. It's not even hard. But we have to choose. We, we have to submit and recognize daily our need to take up our cross, follow him, and to grab a hold of all that he's offering, which it's easy to get. My word to all of us today is simply this. Be aware of the ongoing, very normal, natural temptation to sell our birthright. You're tempted, I'm tempted to do it every day, throughout the day. Be aware of the normal temptation to despise what God is faithfully lavishing upon us, and therefore, be aware of the need to repent daily. Take up the cross of humble obedience and submission to him 
trusting him to give all the spiritual blessings that are ours as adopted children, never running out and never holding back. Yes, I need to repent daily. I'm not saying I give in to every temptation to sell my birthright, but I know I do enough. And God knows we do enough. That's why he included the, the call of confession, the call of recognizing I am weak. And the flesh is so easy to grab hold of. We need to do as Paul did. We need to give thanks, friends. To faithfully give thanks and know with confidence not only is our inheritance waiting for us, but is in fact being given to us every day out of his grace and his ongoing work in us, all for his glory. My prayer for all of us is that we will see the stew for what it is. And ask God for the strength and the desire to just get rid of it. What he gives, as Jesus said, is the eternal bread of life. Far better than anything this world could ever give. And God's people need to say amen to that. Blessed Father, it is my prayer that we would learn from this Old Testament story about a very normal temptation that we all face every day. And it is my prayer, Lord God, that we would humble ourselves before you, that we would not take our birthright for granted, that we would not hold it with contempt. Father, I pray for wisdom and discernment to see those places that we most often Trade for stew. Show us those places. With your heads closed, bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, I'm doing something I don't normally do. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, so relax. just want you to take a moment and really ask the Lord to show you places, show you parts of your life that you tend to trade for stew. Maybe it's fear, the fear of man. Maybe it's times when you're really tired or stressed. Whatever it is, ask the Lord to show you where you might attempt to trade for steel. And ask the Lord for mercy to genuinely care enough to throw the stew out and seek him more. Engage him more. Blessed Father, the, the truth is it's not if we have a stew. It's just how many but it is my prayer, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with a desire to feast upon your bread far more than we do anything that this world offers. That you would be the focus of our hearts, the desire of our hearts. That in all the little and big things of everyday life, you would be the center part of it and not simply our opinions or wants or sense of priority. Lord God, may you set the pace. May you set the objective. May we follow you obediently. I pray these things in Jesus' name. chapter 8 of your God laid into my heart to read that here in the message the words of Romans chapter 8 therefore there is now no condemnation to 
those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life to set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law was powerless to do was it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, whoever, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life through the righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now we are children and we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Stand and sing, oh how good it is.
God brought to mind. You ask God to help you take the place. Ask him just one place, one place that you tend to sell your birthright for and ask God to make that particular stew so spoiled in your mouth and in your heart that you just want to get rid of it. Just take one by one to the cross. Let God fill you with the bread of life. We are his workmanship. So we give praise to his name for the blessed day of He's got dino backpack.